Okay, Kevin Roach, 1922-2019. So he died two years ago and he almost made it to 100 years old. Um, a very prolific architect. Uh, and uh, if by success we mean building a lot, he was very successful. And if we mean um, by success building large buildings, then he was very successful. And if we mean building for large corporations, again, we would say a very successful architect. If we mean uh, laureate of, uh, of the Prisker Prize, then again, Kevin Roach would qualify as a very successful architect. So uh, I will read a little bit about him. Uh, him on uh, Kevin Roach, FAIA, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects or Architecture, born uh, June 14th, and that's why we talk about him today. Next year, it will be his centennial, was an Irish-born American Prisker Prize winning architect. He has been responsible for the design master planning for over 200 built projects in both the United States and abroad. These projects include eight museums, 38 corporate headquarters, seven research facilities, performing arts centers, theaters, and campus buildings for six universities. As you can see, we do not see any social housing here. In 1967, he created the master plan for the Metropolitan Museum of Art and henceforth designed all of the new wings and installation of many collections, including the recently reopened American and Islamic wings. Born in Dublin and a graduate from University College, Roach went to the United States to study with Ludwig, Ludwig van Mies van der Rohe at the, at the Illinois Institute of Technology. In the United States, he became the principal designer for Eero Sarinen and opened his own architectural firm in 1967. Among, among other awards, Roach received the Pritzker in 1982, the gold medal award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1990 and the AIA gold medal in 1993. I begin with this picture of him, which I like. Uh, I like I like the man I look at, and uh, I like also the the oxymoronic uh, meeting between uh, the book, which might be the Bible. Uh, I mean, it's possible it's not the Bible, but for some reason, I I I, I choose to imagine that it is the Bible, and then the glass of wine in front of it. How would that be? You know, to read wine while you read. Uh, the Bible, but it's very possible it was not the Bible. So then forgive me for my, for some reason, I, I, I keep uh, dwelling on this, that he was a, a good Catholic. Anyway, I could be wrong, but uh, he does look like a Pope, actually. I like the way he looks, uh, in fact, but I don't like the fact that he sold his soul to all those 38 uh, uh, corporations. Um, anyway, I even like this picture. He looks like a little bit like Joseph Brodsky, the Nobel Prize laureate in poetry from Russia, well, who also arrived to the States. And here in a less uh, modest uh, posture, um, what can we say? A successful architect. I don't know exactly what he's sitting on. I guess another a smaller or less tall uh, skyscraper. Uh, predictable uh, positioning of, a, of an architect to sit on the building of another architect. Perhaps, perhaps, I don't know, again. Also rather predictable are the suspenders for his trousers, for his pants. You know, um, architects, if they don't wear bow ties and if they don't wear extravagant um, eye frames, uh, eyeglasses, uh, then they were uh, suspenders. You can miss an architect, especially a successful architect from his uh, idiosyncratic uh, choices. And here he is in his older age. Uh, it's not when he received the Pritzker because he got the Pritzker when he was 60 years old and he is older here. 
uh, another one one of uh, of the other uh, prizes that he received. So he worked actually with John Dinkaloo. Uh, they formed a long and fruitful partnership. He didn't work alone, but I imagine he was the designer, and John Dinkaloo Dinkalo, uh, took care of all the other things, the unpleasant things that have to do with architecture. Uh, and here they are, the two of them. Uh, I like again the, 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 the in a way, the way uh, Kevin Roach uh, looks like. Um, you know, he was the artist, obviously, even uh, in the way he, he uh, presents himself in this picture. But he is here older indeed. Anyway, let's look at, at some of his works. As I said, I, I made this notice. I didn't read these two works together somewhere. I thought of it and maybe uh, I'm totally wrong, maybe. The Ford Foundation in New York is a very important work by him. Uh, it's this building here. And uh, we already see here, we see the, the Chrysler building and this building is, um, you know, for a famous uh, car maker uh, uh, foundation uh, uh, headquarters. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a good building, you know, in the modern, uh, uh, using the modern language. It's, it's a, it's a good building, and it has uh, qualities uh, at the interior as well. It's monumental, but not crushing, really. I mean, for the scale of, of New York City, of Manhattan. And the plan is very functional in L, but then it's this huge atrium with a garden. Um, you know, it, it, it's a pleasant, uh, it's a pleasant uh, construction. Um, Recording in progress. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is one of his best works, and I think his best architecture happened until about mid-80s. From mid-80s onwards, maybe also affected by uh, postmodernism, maybe, although he never employed, uh, you know, uh, Doric columns or anything like that. But there was a slight touch of change in his work, which, which uh, disheartened me, and I stopped the presentation right then. Uh, but this building I like, and uh, you know, it's in Manhattan. Of course, this is not in a little village in Tibet. It, it, it works fine for Manhattan. And it works fine also for, uh, you know, the beneficiary, that is Ford. So uh, it couldn't be a too modest building. He has in some of his works a, a sensitive relationship with nature, garden or otherwise. But not in all of them, only in some of them. Also, it, to me, is a little bit surprising that he worked for Hiro Sarinen because an explicit influence of Sarinen in his work, I do not see. And apparently he was a principal designer for Eero Sarinen. But maybe the love for nature, which appears in some of his works, maybe, maybe it comes indirectly or also from uh, Eero Sarinen, who as a true Scandinavian, who was, uh, his father was an important Finnish architect. He was born in the States, but, uh, you know, the Finnish blood was uh, obviously, um, um, you know, flowing through his veins. I'm talking about Eero Sarinen. While uh, it's also very possible that at least to an extent, the Irishness of um, Kevin Roach cannot be denied. And I'm not at all uh, an expert in uh, Irish uh, mythology or, um, you know, certain uh, characteristics of what Ireland might stand for. But I see something in his work that is not totally, um, that, that could be perhaps connected uh, with, uh, with Ireland. I, when I arrive at those works, I will let you know. Um, 
he received very important commissions. I mean, you know, uh, he already received at 60 the Pritzker Prize. So obviously he did since 1950. Well, no, uh, at 60, he was, this was in 1982. So between 1970 and 1982, in 12 years, he built many important works. He was a darling of the big corporations, that's for sure. And we'll see some uh, pharaonic uh, efforts from him. I mean, even this building, you know, it's, um, it's clearly not a building that was very concerned with, uh, you know, saving space, so to speak, or to use every square inch. In Manhattan, a square inch costs a lot. Well, here you have a huge atrium which is, uh, you know, without uh, any other function except to uh, host some trees and a lot of um, open space. We saw this picture already. Now a convention center in Dublin, a later work, which is uh, show already, showing already signs of, uh, of um, bombastic bombasticism. I would say, um, I don't see too much, to, sorry for this, too much sensitivity here. It's, uh, it's, no, it's, it's kind of a simplistic and brutal breaking of the box, but uh, still remaining somehow in the box. Uh, it appears to be interesting, but in my opinion, it's a simplistic building. I mean, look at these elevations, you know, this one also on the other side is the same thing. And even this one, you know, it's 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 really a bombastic building. Uh, I, it doesn't matter during the day or during the night. I think he could have done better, and he did better in some some other buildings. But this one, I think, is um, you know, it could have been in Las Vegas very well, not in Dublin. That very Dublin that uh, Stephen Stephen, uh, the great uh, character and alter ego of James Joyce. Uh, lived in and uh, then left for Trieste. I'm talking about the great Irish writer James Joyce, was a friend, a friend, a friend of Brinkush, Constantine Brinkush. Well, what can we say? It's also true that the buildings around it are so, you know, so-called modern buildings. And talking about modern, the word modern, uh, the latest works of the of the firm, Kevin Roach, uh, John Dinkelu, because the firm still ex exists, the latest works are under the, the, the naming or the title um, Roach uh, Modern, you know, as if the others were not modern. Anyway, strange, uh, strange wording. Uh, what can we say? You know, it's, 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 it's another building, a big building. But this one, the Oakland Museum in California, I like. And I like because it is very different in a way. It's the opposite of the building that we just saw. It's labyrinthical, it's complex, it's fragmented, it's decentered. Look at this here. And in my opinion, it's better than uh, certain works uh, I showed under the title Green Over Gray by uh, Emilio Ambash. Here, I think we have a, a, a more genuine green over gray, and not just because literally it is green over gray, but because of the fragmentation that is not a monolithical building. I think this is the the, the greenest thing about this building, then it's, it, that is not monolithical. And it, 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 architecture becomes landscape and landscape becomes architecture. So this is the building. I think it's a beautiful museum. You know, where is the museum? Well, it's here. It is and it isn't. And uh, uh, he, he, he mingles the, the green with the gray and uh, I, I think I think it's an inspired work. By for this work, I would have given him the Pritzker, but not for many others. Although he has two or three more which are good, but I would include this one. 
uh, it's democratic. It's um, it's, uh, it's it's not again. It's not monolithical. It's not uh, totalitarian. It's not how so many museums are. This is a decentered, uh, fragmented, dispersed uh, museum. Look at the beautiful plan. I really think it is. Who would think of a museum like this? But Kevin Roach and John Dinkelo did, and I'm very glad they did, and I'm very glad they built it. It's truly really one of the better museums that I know. <clears throat> Even today, uh, museums uh, attempt, uh, attempt to look very, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, egocentric in a way. They 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 want to uh, to shine to shine. They want to be, uh, you know, to attract attention in a in a in a, in a you know almost obnoxious way. Here we have a museum which which is uh, not uh, intended to impress, and 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 it, exactly because of that it does. Uh, it's really one of the best works by uh, Kevin Roach, and it is an early work from 1960s. Uh, you know. Uh, so he was 40 years something, 40, he was not yet 50. So again, the main quality, in my opinion, about of this building is not so much that literally here and there, if not everywhere, the green is over the gray, but because it is not monolithic, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a building that, that is uh, uh, fragmented. And the such is closer in a way to the spirit of nature or to the spirit of that spontaneous order that science arrived at the conclusion that nature has. It's also not symmetrical. It doesn't have, you know, hierarchy, strong hierarchies. Uh, it, it's a good building. And it doesn't matter that it has parts which are indeed of concrete, meaning gray. It's okay. It's a building. Now we arrive at uh, this uh, <laughs> um, different kind of building, 1969, Edna Life and Casualty Com Company Computer. It's, <laughs> it's, it has quality. It is monumental. It is, uh, uh, he is good at, uh, Kevin Roach was good at, at creating sometimes memorable monumentalities, but uh, when you think about its function, you know, uh, forget the Aetna. Think about life and casualty company computer headquarters. I don't know exactly how the computer connects with life and casualty, uh, whatever. It, it is, a, it is a, a corporation and uh, it looks like, a, you know, it could have been a mausoleum almost. I mean, look at this. You know, it's a it's a citadel. It's a, I don't know. In a way, I like it. In another way, I dislike it. It's 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 too monumental. It's too uh, exclusivist in a way. You know, it's it's opaque. But inside there are some qualities, I guess. Uh, what is this? Some dining space? I mean, a cantina or of some sort. Anyway, what can we say? Now we arrive at the Power Center for the Performing Arts, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, 1971. Uh, one would, would call these powerful buildings, but it depends what we mean by power. Yes, there is, you know, obviously some kind of so-called power, you know, uh, in, in fact, too much so. You know, just compare this building, for example, with a building by Carlos Carpa. The building by Carlos Carpa almost does not exist. Here is too much building in a way. It's too, not that it is bad, it's, it's good, but uh, let's look again at the function. Power Center for the Performing Arts. Maybe, maybe its name correlates with its image, a power center. It is indeed a power center, but is it the power of art that we look at here? Or is it the power of money? Or is it the power of a corporation? Um, I think it is less about the power of art. I think it's, it's, 
the in the balance between uh, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of subtleness from the famous French saying l'esprit de géométrie and l'esprit de finesse, I would say here there is more uh, spirit of geometry than spirit of fineness. You know, this kind of architecture was built around that time also by I.M. Pei, uh, you know, with small differences. In essence, this was a capitalist uh, interpretation even of humanistic programs. And uh, it was done, yes, with conviction, maybe at times too much conviction. I would have welcomed a little bit of doubting here, but I don't see it. Um, it's not bad, but uh, it's kind of a facile optimism, I think, and a little bit simplistic. But, but again, it's not a bad building as a whole. It's just that its modernity is a little bit uh, too predictable and uh, a little bit too so-called powerful. And uh, this last image that I show about this work, uh, you know, is again a celebration of, of number, of quantity, of uh, the acceleration of uh, the ac acceleration of 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 of, uh, of number, of the number, I would say, and less of of uh, uh, minute detail or uh, intimate detail or even uh, esoteric detail. Now, look at this. We are dealing here with the Knights of Columbus headquarters. I don't know what this is, but uh, I'm already uh, unsettled when I see Knights of Columbus headquarters. It's another corporation, the Knights of Columbus. I have to tell you, I visited Columbus for a few hours, and uh, very rarely I saw so much misery as in, uh, in, in the capital of Ohio. It's just incredible. Uh, downtown uh, Columbus, you walk for walk for miles, and you see no one on the on the sidewalk, and you see you know uh, uh, buildings that should be demolished, uh, uh, you know passing cars. It's a very depressing uh, city, if we are to call it a city. And I'm talking. I walked for uh, four or five miles. Uh, in Columbus, and I, I got very, very disturbed. But I'm glad that there were and there are knights of Columbus. You know, you know what a knight is. And look at the building. Indeed, it is for knights. This is not for uh, any kind of human being. These are for crusaders. You know, for knights uh, dressed in armor. Maybe they went to work dressed in armor, and not uh, you know like every other mortal. This building. Here was also done by him, but I think this was demolished. Anyway, uh, what can we say? Power, power, and power again. If by power we mean nothing else but power, but uh, I don't know. I mean, the ideality of the plan uh, on one hand uh, is likable, but on the other hand is dislikable. Uh, but it is amazing in a way that uh, the corporate world uh, in, in this country, in the United States at that time, allowed for uh, and even encouraged perhaps this kind of idealized uh, uh, architectures. You know, in a way, it told, it told the truth. This is not an architecture that lies. No, the architecture of Kevin Roach is telling the truth the truth about what capitalism is, about what the corporate world is. It's, it's, it's a world that rules. They rule. The Knights of Columbus or some other place, they, they rule. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we have the horizontality of the world of the cars and we have the verticality of the world of the offices. And the two uh, feed on each other, so to speak. Are these medieval towers? Uh, well, no, but uh, now, if this was a city with um, 
man, it's too complicated now to go into it. It's just that my memory of Columbus is a very depressing one. And um, I wonder where this triumphalism comes from, you know. This is the horizontal building which was destroyed. I think it was demolished. Both buildings are not bad. Both the horizontal one and the vertical are not bad. You know, it's just that uh, they they manifest a, a level of ideality or idealism, which is um, not above, um, you know, uh, reproach, so to speak. Because when you think about the function, this is these are not buildings that serve res publica, meaning the public. They, they are still private buildings of private uh, companies and they don't truly have, they don't truly care about social, you know, interaction or social values. It's really a, an image, a corporate image. The temples of consumption. Here, here they are. I told you that that building was destroyed, it was demolished, and they are. I wrote this when I made this presentation, the temples of consumption. In a way, this is what it is, the temples of consumption. And um, I think we have to watch out because these uh, powerful, uh, uh, there are knights everywhere in the world uh, that organize themselves in huge companies and they rule with a stronger arm than perhaps uh, even the arm of uh, ancient uh, emperors. Now, this is an interesting work. A US, U.S. postal office, he built it, I think, in the 60s. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't say this is a postal office. Uh, interestingly, he was able to build such a building, you know, I mean, a lot of money here was spent for uh, representation, for image, not for uh, function. I mean, all these these columns, you know, you'd you'd say that it's some kind of a temple here. It's a U.S. postal office, and actually, the actual building is somewhere hidden here. I don't know exactly how they afforded to pay for all this thing, which is which is okay as architecture, it looks okay, but I see here also similar things. This is a huge thing. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, you probably know, you probably read, uh, I don't know if you are interested in news from the United States, but the United States Postal Office has huge debt. A huge debt is, uh, is, is uh, essentially a bankrupt institution. At that time, perhaps it was not in the 60s and 70s. But still, this glorious uh, architecture for a postal office uh, seems to be, to me, be even intimidating. I, I don't dislike it as a building. It's just that it seems to be a disjunction if we think about its, um, its theme, its, its function. No. Anyway, United States Post Office. Now we arrive at another building uh, by him, the College Life Insurance Company. Uh, forget the word college. I don't know what that, where that comes from. This is about the life insurance company. And they make a lot of money on what? On fear. It's about fear. If you open the radio in the United States, or if you open the radio now in the Romania, you hear. Are you over 40? Are you insured? You are not insured? And immediately fear is, uh, is, is born in your soul, trembling soul, because you realize you are over 50 and you are not insured. So that's the end of you. So then you rush to the, the insurance company and with trembling hands give your last money to buy an insurance to, you know, uh, give you eternal life possible. And what does the insurance company do with your money? I'll show you what. In response to a growing company's request 
for office space, Kevin Roach, John Dinkelu and associates developed a master plan that would allow the incremental addition of floor, for floor space over time. The initial design included nine identical buildings arranged in a parallelogram, totaling 1.2 million square feet. Only three of the buildings were constructed in the initial phase and the expansion plan was never fulfilled. The trio is known as the pyramids for their simple geometry and slanting glass facades. Here they are. So this is what the life insurance company does with the money you gave them with trembling or not so trembling hands. Based on your fear, they build pyramids. They intended to build more pyramids. They just built three pyramids. But still, you know, I mean, if we compare these pyramids with the, the Egyptian pyramids, we see a, a great change in the function of the pyramids. These pyramids are not about cosmos, about eternal life. Uh, they are also, and this is a good thing, not about burying some pharaoh there, but they are about uh, housing a number of... Uh, uh, bureaucrats who are and were busy to uh, manage the money you handed them. Uh, what can we say? It, 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 it's, it's, it's a good building, no? Pro perhaps, you know, maybe if uh, Peter Zumthor would have built this, this building, he would have called it a large chapel. It's not a large chapel, it's an office building built by Kevin Roach and John Dinkelow. Or here, you know, I mean, really, uh, I referred uh, again a little bit maliciously to Peter Zumthor because we know his chapel with a, just a door on an opaque facade, just like we see here, a door, an opening into an uh, opaque uh, facade. Well, here we have an insurance company and there we have the so-called chapel, which inside though, that building is good, but here, it's a different story. It's a North American building celebrating again, a powerful, robust, this is the word, robust capitalism. Uh, you know, the armchairs, once you sit on it, you don't feel like getting up because they are so accommodating and so comfortable that uh, you would rather spend the rest of your life in one of these armchairs. And uh, what can we say? All this lux calme volupte is based on your fear and even more based on making money on your fear. Three pyramids, the knights of architecture, here they are by the Prisker Prize laureate, um, John, um, John Dinkelo. Should we place him for a change first? John Dinkelo and Kevin Roach. Who said that life on earth is not great? Looking at these buildings, you have certainly no reason to say that it is not. When you look at these buildings, you even wonder how come in the world came Sigmund Freud? You know, once am, I am insured at this great insurance company, all my worries should go away, right? I wouldn't need Sigmund Freud. Uh, everything is fine here, from the chairs, large conference table, well-lit uh, ceiling, and look at them. This is what they, they wanted to build, you know, uh, some kind of a corporate uh, plan voisin by Le Corbusier, but uh, plant, uh, you know, in the middle of the United States. Um, I don't know, it's something both uh, sad and ridiculous about this project. Look at this, you know, <laughs> the triumphalism of, uh, of, uh, of, of money, essentially, and the futility of it all, you know, because with all these, how many, nine, nine pyramids, death can still not be, cannot be uh, avoided. And so this is just, uh, in a way, a trick, you know, to make some people extremely rich 
uh, while your trembling self remains a trembling self. And look here, you know, <laughs> again, you know, it's, it's, it's clear, it's clear that this company was doing very well. If by doing very well, we mean making a lot of money. Your fear of death translates into this building that the money went straight into this. Or look here, you know, it's organization, light, clarity, uh, unity of purpose. And essentially at bottom is nothing else but the fear every one of us has about the ephemerality of life. Look at that conference table, you know. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'm envious. And here is a facade of the whole, uh, you know, uh, grouping of buildings. Of course, they built only three, but even those three uh, already say a lot. And here is the glorious plan. <laughs> Do you see how easy it is to get the Pritzker Prize? Really, it's very easy. You just need to be connected with a certain uh, number of large corporations and bill for them. And then, you know, the Pritzker pops up just, you know, uh, by itself. And look at the site plan. I imagine that this, this uh, L here consists of a generous parking lot, right? And then we have the nine pyramids. Well, right here we have, you know, the quintessence of capitalism, you know, an unending mobility facilitated by the car, parking, parking, and again parking, and here there are the highways on which the cars run, and then we have the pyramids for the knights of insurance, those who can uh, assure you that if you die, your family will get some money, and if you don't die, well, wait, this is not possible. So if you die, everything will be fine because everything is handled well by the knights of handling things well. St. Nicholas Orthodox Church. Well, since I'm talking now to many Romanians, I have to show also a, a project by Kevin Roach and John Dinkelo for an Orthodox Church. He didn't win the commission. It was Calatrava who won it and he built it. But we see how accommodating Kevin Roach was. You know, he imagined a church as almost anyone would have imagined it. This is the, the, the building he proposed. And uh, here it is, right? Uh, it's uh, not far away from uh, ground zero. And uh, as I said, uh, Calatrava built it, but uh, apparently it was a uh, competition and Kevin Roach participated and he didn't win. Well, we are dealing here with another kind of corporation, a spiritual corporation, if we are to call it so. <clears throat> the same kind of thing is not the insurance company, is uh, not the Knights of uh, Columbus, is the Knights of... Uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Christianity, and in the name of Jesus, who was the, mo the most modest, modest uh, being on earth, they built temples, large buildings. Um, maybe I shouldn't call them temples, but you understand, temples of power, and this is one of them. And you see Kevin Roach serving the church properly, you know, because the, the Orthodox Church uh, is fond of having icons everywhere. He took care of this requirement adequately. And the building, what can we say, you know? It could have been. Is, is the one by Calatrava much better? I don't know. I don't think it is. It's kind of the same thing, you know. Uh, but it's really about power, not the power of... Uh, of uh, explicitly a, a, a money-making uh, machine that the insurance companies are, but uh, of the money-making machine that the church is. Yeah. Uh, gold, no? It's gold. 
let's not forget what uh, Baudelaire said, you know, when he was asked if he loves gold and he said, I hate it in as much as you hate God. But it seems the church doesn't think so. For the church, the Orthodox church, the gold is God. Anyway, Fine Arts Center, 1974, University of Massachusetts. This is a, a kind of an interesting building. Uh, I like this brutalism, you know. I like the, the it, it, it is a little bit simplistic, but it has a, a, a vigor that I'm not indifferent to. This is the library. And I like the patina of the concrete. I like the fact that, you know, somehow the dirt on the concrete was not banished. Well, here it was. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. In some pictures it shows up, in other pictures there is on, on, on the web uh, even a, a website or an article or something, a title of something about the... I, ideals behind the, the, the dirty concrete in uh, Kevin Roche's work. I still think the architecture of the 60s and 70s had qualities which ours do not have. Um, or, yeah, uh, you know, it, there is a level of, of honesty here, maybe at times brutal, maybe at times simplistic, but uh, there is something that I like in this uh, so-called brutalist architecture. What I don't like is, and, and, and it's known now that concrete and working with concrete is very polluting. I don't care too much about this building, but it was part of the complex that they built. Now the Center for the Arts, this university in, I'm sorry, the Middletown in Connecticut. Uh, this also has some qualities. It's all, almost, you know, it's an architecture that is so, in a way, uh, unwilling to, um, to be a pleaser that it becomes pleasant. You know, what, what campus of a university would look like this, or even, you know, it's a center for the arts, but it's, it's literally a citadel, it's a fortress, but I don't think it's, a, it's an arrogant fortress. And I like what I see here, you know, it's uh, the, you know, the playing land uh, ground is nearby and then the structure, of the building is, is regular, yes, and it has a lot of opacity, opaque walls, but uh, it's something that I like about it. I don't mind that it doesn't have fluid forms or anything. I think it has a level of sincerity which I admire. Now, it could have had another function. In fact, if I look at this building and I re recall the um, crematorium and adjacent buildings by Gunnar Asplund in Stockholm, I don't see really a great, great, great difference from an aesthetical point of view. But uh, if art represents a, a bulwark of resistance, and it is, and it should be, then these buildings tell the truth. This is what art is. It's, 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 it's a stance of resisting commercialism, uh, frivolousness, bourgeois values, and so on. So as such, to be a citadel is probably appropriate. Now, another good building by them in a very different, uh, using a very different architectural language because he used uh, Corten here, 1978, 
these uh, these people John Deere uh, they produce uh, high quality equipment uh, you know machineries and so on and the building is uh, i think uh, uh, skillfully done Sorry for the, this not very great uh, resolution, but we'll, we'll arrive at some other pictures that are better. I think he, uh, he was still able to, to uh, although it was about a big uh, company and the headquarters and all the rest, but the way he brings nature in and then the tension between the green of nature and the brownish colors of the, of the curtain and the fact that well, it's an illusion in a way. I mean, the Corten gives the impression that it's rusted iron as such. It gives you the impression that it's about the passage of time. And I like rust very much. Um, I like the building, you know. It's because both nature and the building somehow acknowledge the presence of time because of the patina of the court and, and uh, you know, the association with, uh, with rust. It's a good building, I think. They did a good job here. Well, the, the plan was not really built like this, but uh, very close. And uh, again, you see the nature, you see nature uh, coming inside the building in the courtyard. It's a metallic building, but I think the, for example, this picture I think is, is, is well taken. It's a detail of the building. You have glass, you have metal, and uh, somehow uh, there is a level of sensitivity here. I see here skill uh, as a designer. And structurally is, uh, is clear how things go on here. And you have, uh, there, are, there is a level of sophistication here. Now the headquarters for, uh, this is in Madrid in Spain and already I'm beginning to lose patience with Kevin Roach. Uh, here, uh, here it is, okay. This image might be interesting to some people, maybe even to me to an extent, but in essence is about uh, a monumentality that uh, tries to be dramatic and uh, maybe it succeeds. But again, the question is, what is this? Headquarters of Santander Central Hispano located. I don't know what this is, probably a, uh, whatever it is, it's about power either the power of high learning, let's say a college or the power of uh, high uh, income uh, uh, institutions like uh, insurance companies. Look at this, you know, we are, we are uh, in the realm of bombasticism here. That's what we, that's what, that's what we look at here. You know, uh, there is more bombasticism here than in the previous work that we saw. And then uh, bom the bombasticism goes on and on, you know, I mean, why is this canopy here so, you know, uh, curved here for what? Is, is some kind of a plane going through this opening or, uh, in my opinion, these are, you know, I am advocating capriciousness. I do think uh, art is also about uh, some irrational gestures. But here, you know, this mimicking, like here, okay, we have a building, but this thing here is doing what? It's, it's, it's the rhetorics of spending a lot of money for uh, an image. And here as well, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I think that what we look at here is an architecture that serves more so-called civilization than culture. And being so is less architecture. I would say even this building is centralized and is, I, I don't know, it, to, to me, it doesn't have a lot of uh, nobility. And this thing is, I would say, almost ridiculous, you know. But this is my opinion. I could be wrong.
I think if Kevin Roach was able to be a little bit more modest, sometimes he had qualities as a, as a designer, as an architect, and sometimes he, he was able to, to do uh, good buildings. But at other times, and especially so in his later years, everything became bigger, bigger and bigger and corporate and corporate and, you know, uh, I'm not impressed. I like the artworks that I see here on the walls, it's true, but uh, I'm referring to artworks, not to the building. Otherwise, the, the environment, yes, is very civilized and very clean and well lit and so on, but uh, I prefer to look at the artworks than at uh, this uh, column or whatever it is, or the ceiling or even the wall. What is this? Another Air IT administration building. This I like from the early 70s. I think it's an administration building for the student union, but I don't know exactly where it is. It's an early work by him. And I think he was better then, you know, again, that robustness that I mentioned. It's still a citadel, it's a fortress, but um, I think it's well done. Uh, using this language, you know, uh, a little bit later than mid-century uh, modernism. And uh, <laughs> the Pope was supposed to visit there. We saw the building, the Knights of Columbus, and what the three images that we are going to see after after this made me think of asking myself, Catholic uh, capitalism, you know, <laughs> when I look at this picture, I realize that uh, he was, uh, he was truly, uh, uh, you know, very respectful, so to speak, towards uh, papacy, towards the Pope. It was supposed to be a large gathering, uh, you know, to, to welcome the Pope. But there is something about it which is so, in a way, naive and, and so, you know, uh, I don't know. This kind of magnificence uh, leaves me cold. And this is the, the model of it. Um, you know, it's like, I mean, you could have, if you had here, you too, the band or the Pope would have been the same thing, you know, it's still, about entertainment in a way, you know, entertainment in the name of God or entertainment in, in the same of rock uh, or pop. It, it's still entertainment. I, I'm not convinced. And now we end the presentation on Kevin Roach with a skyscraper he built in New York, which is not really bad, but, you know, I don't know what is this here, but it, in a way, uh, we saw recently the building built by Bjarke Ingels, who, you know, not dissimilar, completely dissimilar to what we see here, um, in, in essence. Yes, uh, a skyscraper. It's okay, I guess. He did worse building than this one. And then, uh, you know, the street of, in Manhattan, which used to be full of... Uh, spiritual uh, advertising, some sarcastic, of course, uh, it's the Coke, it's this is the real king and this is the real God, the Coke, either Pepsi or the Coke, and then uh, other similar things. Anyway, a tall building. Although in the realm of tall buildings, it's not the worst tall building ever built because it still has this uh, certain rhythmicity, rhythmicity and, uh, you know, uh, an allusion to the ziggurat in a way, which also inspired the uh, Bjarke Ingels. Now, sorry, uh, this is, uh, I had a presentation about both. We are not going to talk about Hans Pelzig, but we are going to talk now about uh, Arthur Erikson, who, in my opinion, uh, is almost a little bit better than Kevin Roach, although he didn't receive the Prisker Prize. 
uh, Arthur Erickson, 1924, uh, and they were almost uh, the same age. And he lived a little bit less than uh, Kevin Roach. He died at, uh, uh, what? Let me see if I can count. 85. Uh, Arthur Erickson uh, was a Canadian, as you see, born June to 14th, uh, a Canadian architect and urban planner. He studied, this is interesting, he studied initially languages, Asian languages, at the University of British Columbia, and later earned a degree from McGill University School of Architecture. This is something that in other countries is very possible. You start uh, studying whatever else, not architecture, and then you continue your studies uh, to earn a master in architecture or whatever. Uh, he's renowned for designing some of the most recognizable buildings and sites in Canada, including Roy Thompson Hall, Robson Square, the Museum of Glass, and the Simon Fraser University campus. So. Arthur Erickson, uh, we start from the bottom up, uh, from his shoes to his uh, approximately ironed uh, uh, trousers. And uh, yes, there is no doubt that he is an architect. Uh, uh, although when he was younger, he seemed to be less self-assured, but I guess building successful buildings made him uh, look like he looks in this, in this picture. Uh, <laughs> yes. Who wouldn't marry such a man, right? But I like him more as a young man here. And this building, this the model he looks at, we are going to see, and it's an interesting building. But I question, I ask you, what makes, what makes, or what made a man become from this man, this man? You know, it, it, it's not just that he's older in the previous picture. It, it's, it's kind of a different man. Here is a man who even has the, the shade of a, of a beard somehow. And uh, I don't know, it's something about him. Maybe because here he still was under the influence of those Asian studies. He was truly influenced by, by those studies. Not only he studied languages, but he was immersed in Asian culture. And this, this was important. And this has to be underlined when we talk about Arthur Erickson. Some drawings by him, uh, maybe not with much glory. What can we say? Perspectival drawings. Uh, I like more what is not a building, you know, um, insinuations of vegetation, something in the sky. Uh, um, but, but again, a great architect doesn't necessarily make great uh, drawings. Some do, some don't. Uh, and some do great drawings, but they are not great architects. He was a good architect. Uh, sometimes he, <laughs> he indulged in, the, in, in fantasies like, like this drawing, uh, so-called visionary, uh, or this one also equally so-called uh, visionary or this one, so-called uh, visionary. And uh, a sketch for a house we are going to see. He built, and it looks better built than drawn. And the large university campus he built, which looks better built than drawn. And the sketch uh, sections through, uh, I think, uh, a judicial building. Uh, and we arrive very soon at his first uh, built work layered landscapes. Perhaps this is a, an appropriate uh, naming for his work. It is layered indeed, and sometimes it is about landscapes, but not really landscape architecture, but uh, a layered architecture that somehow indirectly and in an abstract way could refer to a landscape. But we start with this house from 1955 in British Columbia. And um, here he is with a cat there, some, some perhaps in his uh, arms. Anyway, uh, the pictures here are not great, but we see a similarity between the building and the sketches that we look, looked at uh, before. Uh, already we see that he's, uh, he was fortunate to, to be commissioned in uh, you know, very special uh, 
natural uh, context. This one from 1958, the Filberg residence, uh, uh, the interior is more uh, conventional and uh, so is the exterior, but soon will arrive at more uh, unsettling uh, architectures. He's, he was still trying to break the box, so to speak, of uh, box of modernity. Uh, there was a sculptor, I would say, in Arthur Erickson. He had sculptural uh, uh, qualities and tendencies, uh, like, for example, here in this uh, hearth, you know, is um, rather sculptural, is it not? Now, a house uh, from 1960, sorry, number one is missing there. 1916, Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, is increasingly uh, uh, moving towards um, extending the building towards the outside in, in whatever way as a quest for freedom, as uh, Frank Roy Wright would say. And uh, yes, these are opulent houses, big houses. You know, this could be a small museum. It's a house. Uh, lots of pillows, um, you know, tall ceilings, uh, light coming from above, uh, you name it, uh, great comfort. Is this the living room? Maybe. Now, 1963, another house, Graham House. This one I like. This one, I think, is not much less important than, let's say, falling water. It's different, but water enters underneath the building, just like at falling water. It's a, it's a, it's a good building. It's balanced between man and nature. It is a balance between the, the greeds and the Cartesianism of, of man and the, the sinuousness and uh, irregularities of nature. Is not bad. You know that at, at the falling water, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't want to do what was expected of him. Mr. Kaufman, the, the, the owner of and the, the client of the house, would, would have imagined that Wright made a building that looked at the falling water. Instead, Frank Lloyd Wright, as you know, place the building above the falling water. Just like we see here, the building is placed above the water, except that here is not no falling water. And that was because Frank Lloyd Wright didn't just want to look at the water, but to be with water, to embrace water in a way. And unfortunately, this embrace um, resulted in a great damage done to the building. And when I visited it, uh, there were collectors, they were collecting money for uh, repairing it. It was a very ex expensive uh, procedure because uh, the building was affected uh, structurally by the falling water. In this case, I'm sure it was not affected by this water because this water is almost static. But the idea to bring the fire of the building, the fire of architecture in conjunction, in an embrace, as I put it, with water, to marry fire and water is perhaps a, a noble one, although an adventurous one. The alchemists tried to do this, you know, it, it was known that if you succeed in marrying fire with water, you get some kind of a you know, reward in uh, lapis, as the, the, the alchemist uh, called it, you know, the, um, you, you could get the, the fountain, uh, you arrive at the fountain of eternal youth or whatever. 
Now you would say, you talk about fire. What fire? There is no fire. What I mean is a building, a building, an architecture, in its essence is fire, uh, conceptually speaking, because uh, it, 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 it is not nature and it is based on, 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 uh, on the fire of the human imagination, on the fire of human materials, on the fire of um, design and calculations, uh, and so on. Not to speak about the masculinism of architecture until uh, very recently, because uh, architecture was practiced by a vast majority of men, not women. And red uh, stood for, or redness or fire, stood for um, the masculine principle, the, the king, so to speak, and not the queen. The queen was connected with water, not with fire, like men. Anyway, a building from uh, 1965, this is something different. It's not a house, but it's a large office building, and it's not bad. It's, but uh, in fact, it's very similar to, uh, now that I look at it, I just had this idea. Uh, it's very similar to a building by, uh, it's not so tall like the one done by Vignoli, but uh, uh, it seems the architectural uh, detailing uh, uh, is, is very similar. I would say it's a good building, yes, by Arthur Erickson, as an office building, of course. He built all kinds of buildings. Now, the Smith residence, 1965, West Vancouver, British Columbia, another well-built, uh, well-done, uh, you know, housing uh, project for a single family. Uh, not the most modest building on earth, but uh, I think uh, well done. If by well done we mean a, a, a balanced meeting between man and nature, the work of man and the work of nature, if we are to call it work in the case of nature. He often extends the beams like this, as a, you know, like in the case of Bra Bar. Uh, Bart Prince, uh, you know, uh, in this case, not so much with connecting with the sky, but maybe connecting with the infinite at the horizon. It's, it's, it's a gesture, a liberating gesture. And the fact that he uses wood uh, is a positive fact, I would say. Now, of course, the functionalist would cut these beams here, would say, wait a minute, we cannot do this. And, uh, you know, in a sense, he might be right, you know, especially if we think about, you know, saving as much as possible resources and so on. But architecture is sometimes a little bit foolish because it has to do with, uh, with uh, representation, with... Uh, with the metaphysics of, uh, of, uh, of uh, generating a certain impression and a certain feeling is not just about, you know, calculating everything. 1965 onward in stages, the Simon Fraser University. This is a large building, as you can see already, very large. Uh, it's um, different from the works of Kevin Roach, isn't it? But it's not uh, an immodest uh, university, far from it. Unfortunately, I would say education also became an industry, and this is shown here as well. You know, uh, the music became, the film became, so education, it became too, an industry. And, uh, you know, we are far, of course, from the, <clears throat> the teaching that took place in the imagination of Louis Kahn, Kahn under a tree, because Louis Kahn asked himself, how, is the how was the first school? And he said, well, the first school 
might have been with an old man under a tree surrounded by younger people and talking about, you know, life, education, culture, whatever. But uh, here we are not under a tree with an old man or not uh, surrounded by a circle of students. We are dealing here with, uh, <laughs> with a corporation education the corporation that serves education uh, uh, rhetorically and powerfully. And the tuition of the students uh, go towards uh, building such uh, mammoth uh, campuses. Is the education better than in the case of a, under a tree? I'm not sure. But then the numbers are very different here. You have thousands of students and not just, uh, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 students at the most. Anyway, to teach under a tree, 15 students, you don't need an architect. Here you needed an architect, of course. This is the citadel of learning. Now house, uh, 1967, another house, a little bit different from the previous houses. Uh, because he uses the triangle and uh, I, I would say he uses it uh, convincingly, albeit uh, although a little bit uh, rhetorically, but uh, you know, why did he do it? Because he could. Arthur Erickson with sculptural tendencies. Almost all his private residences were built in um, special, um, you know, landscapes, natural uh, circumstances, as you can see, you know, there is the forest, there is the sloping land, there is the ocean, I mean, there is everything, and there is the sky, of course, so there is everything, except the house, so he provided the house. Now this is a pavilion of Canada in 1970 at the Osaka, the famous Osaka Expo. Uh, and um, apparently, yeah, you see, they received the, the top architectural award. Um, I, I don't understand, I don't know enough about the building, about its symbolism, about its metaphor, but you'll see some pictures with it, of it. It's an exhibition building, so it has inevitably theatrical elements as such. Why it received the top prize, I don't know, because there were some other important structures, including built by Japanese architects like Ikutake. I don't know. Anyway, a temple from 1970, the Ross Street uh, Sikh Temple. And I think this, is, this was an homage by Arthur Erickson to his early education, that is in Asian uh, languages. And this building, uh, unless you know the specifics of the religion he was trying to serve, it's hard to, to evaluate, you know. Uh, I don't know. He built it. Uh, maybe Maybe it's the, the appropriate response to the theme, or maybe not, I, I don't know. I'm not very impressed by, by the architecture I look at, but maybe this is because I don't know the, the, you know, the, the details, so to speak, of, of the program he was trying to, to honor with this building, which is different from the buildings that we saw until now. The uni University Hall, uh, this time, uh, Alberta, 1971, another, you know, uh, impressive uh, constructive effort. Look at this. And yes, I think he chose correctly. You have the landscape, the natural landscape, which is one way. And then you have the architectural uh, building, the building that is uh, kind of... Uh, it's, it's kind of an harmonious contrast. The building is, is cutting nature and, and you have a, a dialectic here between the work of man and the work of God or nature. And 
I would say the work of men uh, is not uh, insignificant and uh, it, it has a certain uh, power, a horizontal power indeed, but uh, power nevertheless. Arthur Erickson, Alberta. It is clear to me that someone with a sculptural um, intuitions or sculptural uh, tendencies or sculptural talent uh, has at his or her disposal uh, qualities that uh, are helpful in architecture. Uh, an elementary school in Vancouver, 1973, um, I'm thinking of these children studying in such a school as opposed to the rectangular box with a door that is shut, is shutting you off from the others. I think they grow in, in, in better circumstances, you know, open to dialogue, open to debate, uh, freer in spirit because they have a well-lit uh, uh, ceiling above, which is also slanted. And uh, it's, 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 it's an environment which um, uh, is not, uh, you know, a sequence of identical rooms on a corridor. I truly think architecture uh, can uh, influence to an extent at least uh, the, the character of one's development. And I would say I, I envy these children, you know, and I, I notice the difference. One who is raised in this way is freer, is more open, is more transparent. It's, 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 it's a different kind of kid than someone who is uh, taught in a, an enclosed, uh, rigid uh, little room. Because in a way, what is happening underneath this, um, um, this uh, glass is, uh, is the house of gathering. It's about gathering. It's about meeting, meeting other children, meeting other people. And uh, as such, it's a good uh, space to study in. You see, they sit on the floor. How many children in our school sit on the floors? I don't think too many. Uh, you know, I, I, I keep advocating even architects and students in architecture to work on the floor. You work on the floor, you become like a child, you become like a toddler, and you become more imaginative, more free. Try it and you'll see it is so. I wish even the professors would sit on the floor to be uh, colleagues and even a family of uh, family members of the students. Anyway, this kind of openness maybe during the pandemic uh, is a little bit problematic maybe, but uh, in more normal conditions, I think is a, is a, is a plus. 1976, now we are going to look at that building that we saw a model of and with a younger Arthur Erickson looking at it. This is the building and here you see also um, the references to East, to the Orient. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think it's an interesting building, although maybe a little bit deterministic uh, because this rhythm is rather regular and, and predictable, but um, still uh, has uh, uh, something uh, interesting, I would say. Not so much in my pictures, they are not great because the resolution is not great, but we'll see a few others which probably are better, uh, like for example this one. Yes, you know, it's theatricality here, it's, it's uh, the power of representation is, uh, is uh, not totally uh, so-called necessary in the name of a dry, simplistic functionalism, but in terms of the, of, the, of the necessities for representation that architecture has, uh, 
uh, it's uh, it's not so bad, I think, despite again a certain um, predictability of the system. You know, the system of repetition, which could be a little bit uh, less of a beneficial surprise. But here is different because because uh, the rhythm is. Uh, I mean, you know, the fact that they are not here in the same plan. These, these elements, as they move towards the center, towards the face of the building, uh, the spacing appears to be different. Uh, like, for example, if we compare these two and, and these two. So there is uh, a level of unexpectedness and um, you know some kind of a, an accidental organicism, or I don't know how to call it. Although the geometry is rather rigorous. But again, I come back to John Ruskin. He might have been right that the most beautiful things in the world are the most useless. As these things are in essence useless. But yes, what is useless often is uh, more interesting, if not more beautiful than what is uh, not so-called useless. Now, a subway station in Toronto, Ontario, 1978, uh, a, large, a large subway station. Uh, architecture is mainly at the ceiling, but maybe not only at the ceiling. What can we say? It's a subway station, a civilized, moderately interesting subway station, but nothing, you know, truly to make you say, wow. Although the ceiling uh, attempts through its diagonals to make you a little bit. Uh, you know, more uh, interested in this. Another subway station also in Toronto, um, different than the previous one because of the curvatures. Uh, some interesting pictures can be taken there, I guess. Arthur Erickson in Toronto. Ever, evergreen building in Vancouver. This is a building that, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there are buildings today being built today or already built that kind of approximate uh, a similar look, you know, terraces and then grass over the terraces and triangles. It's okay, I guess, but uh, not very surprising. There is a French architect, Jean Renaudie, who built something uh, somehow in this spirit, but more uh, adventurous and uh, much more capable of uh, generating uh, visual surprises. Jean Renaudie, a very interesting architect. Unfortunately, he died. Uh, he could have lived longer. Anyway, this is Arthur Erickson, uh, concrete and green. Is it green over, over gray? I don't think so much, actually. You know, I think in that museum in uh, Oakland by, um, uh, by uh, Kevin Roach was more green over gray than here. here and again, it's not so much because of the, the insufficiency of the green, but because of the rigidity of the system, the compositional system, which makes it, I think, less green uh, implicitly. Anyway, he did it. We could also compare it to the building by uh, Emilio Ambash in Japan. Uh, it was apparently more radical. Um, Ambush, but uh, Arthur Erickson is, I think, a little more honest, a little more honest, yes. Uh, we are going to see another housing uh, complex by Arthur, Arthur Erickson. Um, but before that, we are going to look at this uh, judicial court or uh, palace of justice, which is, I think, a good example 
of an architecture which doesn't try to crush you or to provoke fear in you, especially when a palace of justice uh, usually is connected with uh, exactly that. You know, this is about an open architecture with a lot of light that uh, could create in you the feeling that indeed you could find justice in this building. And uh, as such, I think, is a, is a positive building. Now, yes, in terms of architecture, maybe that uh, surface of glass is a little bit too uh, rhetorical, and uh, certainly you need a lot of air conditioning. But I think if you step in this building and you have a judicial problem, you do hope that uh, this light and this space that is offered to you will be uh, uh, auspicious and that you know there will be transparency in the judicial process and nothing will be handled in ominous ways it's a good uh, approach i think to uh, a judicial building and you'll also see an interesting way to handle uh, some stairs in combination with some ramps um, A lot of glass. Now there maybe would have been uh, the proper place for, uh, uh, you know, uh, absorbing, um, you know, the energy of the sun. But he built it before that became so, uh, uh, so you know, uh, so customary. This is what I was talking about. And it's an interesting idea to have steps, but also to have, you know, different kind of steps, almost ramps. Uh, and uh, and uh, in fact, they are ramps. So you have this uh, intertwining of two ways of, uh, of arriving at the same destination. You could choose the steps or you could choose the ramps. I think it's a nice idea and it has been used by others. And it's not the only one. I don't know who first used it, used it but I think it's a good idea. green over concrete, but not too much uh, green and not too much over concrete. Now the Roy Thompson Hall, 1982, we are dealing here with, uh, you know, uh, centralized monolithical building with a spectacular uh, ceiling. We are going to see it again. It's Toronto. It's not a little village, uh, but I don't know, you know. It's, it's, it's about uh, dim dimensions, no? It's about numbers. It's about... Uh, um, uh, there is a level of, of, uh, of uh, inflammation here, if I can say so. But what can you do with such a big building where you have to gather a large number of people to attend, I don't know what show or what concert or what, whatever. the ceiling. So the man who studied uh, Asian literature uh, was quite capable to build even very large buildings. Now a building in England, NAP Laboratories 1983, and uh, I don't know, what can I say? They are laboratories indeed triumphantly slanting uh, the glass walls uh, as they face the sun light. And of course, no window opens, so you need air conditioning. But I guess they afforded it. And they afforded it. Not very sustainable, but at that time, nobody talked about sustainability. So he is not. A... Now we have the King's Landing in Toronto, 1984 another housing complex with the uh, terraces. Uh, this is in uh, uh, Toronto again. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a well-to-do society which um, can afford to build uh, such houses. They are not for everyone, but I miss something, you know, so much newness and modernity. Somehow I miss, I miss that nostalgia that connects me with a certain past. And I remember what Luis Barragan said when he was commissioned to build something in Houston, in Texas, and he couldn't do it. He said, I cannot do it because I have nothing to start from. 
And I guess Arthur Erickson also didn't have here much to start from. So it's just a modern building, well crafted and so on, but I don't know, somehow dry, somehow gray, I would say, literally and metaphorically, although the park is in front of it. And he has another housing uh, project that is, is more interesting. I hope I have it here. The Canadian Chancery, uh, Chancery uh, uh, Consulatul, I imagine, Canadian, 19, well, not really, that would have been consulate, 1989. It's a political building, it's a governmental building, and it shows. And it's also 1989 when postmodernism was still. Uh, uh, ravaging uh, architecture, uh, uh, but uh, it was approaching its uh, its end. Uh, a building is okay, except this uh, this part with columns and this roundness. It is here that postmodernism affected, uh, I would say, the, the rather pure architecture of Arthur Erickson. This. Uh, it's true, in the previous work, I, I, I missed, I said I miss a certain nostalgia having to do with time and history, but this kind of classical touch turns me off. Uh, I know it was a gesture, I imagine it was a gesture of, uh, you know, uh, not respect, but some kind of a, a nuanced, uh, um, maybe not so nuanced, maybe more uh, obvious, uh, you know, indication that this is a, a building having to do with political power. And so, uh, so the columns represent that authority, uh, power. And uh, unfortunately, so-called classicism, as if, you know, governmental power cannot do without classicism in architecture. But I, I think that's exactly the weakness of this building. If this thing didn't exist, this uh, round uh, thing with the columns, I think it would have been better, more honest. Anyway, he did it. A civic center in Ontario, again, 1989, again, a huge building, again, roundness and columns. And again, postmodernism uh, should regret that it came into being, but it did, and it affected even a, a, a rather innocent modernist that Arthur Erickson was at the beginning of his uh, professional life. Anyway, moving forward. Um, Yes, we have electricity, we have columns, we have a blue sky and we have a lake. So we have all the reasons not to need Dr. Freud, but unfortunately it seems Dr. Freud was and still is necessary. If I am to remember that I saw a large map of Manhattan with thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, psychotherapy centers which shows clearly that the world was not and is not as well as it claims it is, like in this picture. And it's not that in Ontario is different from New York, no. It's the same thing. Anyway, arch architecture can only do so much. A convention center in San Diego in California, 1989. Uh, this one is more adventurous, more futuristic, almost space age. Yeah, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but they look interesting. And, uh, you know, he combines the circle with the triangle. So it's, a, it's an environment that is uh, conducive to uh, dy dynamism, to a dynamic whatever, let's call it life. Um, yeah, this is interesting, but I, I don't know exactly what, what they are meant to do this. But, uh, you know, visually, it's engaging. Lots of stairs. Now, a city hall in uh, California, in Fresno, California, 1991. 
uh, not very modest, it's true. Uh, what can we say? A big building, but it has a cut in the center or a, a, a rift, and you are going to see it. You see it in the model, it's here, which, you know, uh, tries to balance things out. Otherwise, the building would have been unbearably monolithical. Now, McGough Hall uh, in University, University of California, 1991. I think uh, just like, uh, just like uh, Kevin Roach, he became increasingly, uh, you know, he didn't build any longer houses. He built these large public buildings and they became somehow more corporate-like and more uh, tiring and, and problematic, I would say, as architecture more banal in essence, in my opinion. This is not, I prefer his early works just as I prefer the early works of Kevin Roach. Two California Plaza in Los Angeles, two skyscrapers. Here they are, these two. And uh, what can we say? They, they are okay, but is it um, architecture? Um, I don't know. I mean, there are two okay buildings. There are two, but anyone could have built them. It happened that it was Arthur Erickson. Ah, lots of glass, lots of air conditioning, no window opens, and uh, lots of people inside uh, working, I don't know what, probably on financial speculation. What else? I'm sure they were not writing poetry in these two buildings. Uh, a library, 1997, with some qualities, but still a lot of glass when you consider it's a library and, and the book and the, and the glass are not great friends. And I'm sure Dominique Perrault knows it because he added a lot of oblongs inside his Bibliothèque de la France, Bibliothèque Nationale de la France in Paris after he also used a lot of glass, just like here. The sunlight hits the book and the book screams. So we pay the price for using so much glass. But the demagogy of the glass seduces and seduced many, many people. The waterfall building, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, again, a lot of glass and concrete. Uh, but here, uh, I like what he did with the stair staircases, spiral staircases at the top. And I hope I have, like here, you know, with these stairs which go to the terrace from these apartments, he created, uh, you know, some kind of an ornamental cornice for the building, which is, I think, uh, an interesting idea, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, a stroke of genius, but uh, as compared to this building, this one has, has some uh, spectacle here, which animates a little bit the, the building. I think it was an interesting idea. Uh, because it was also a gesture of connecting the building with the outside. And in this case, the outside was the terrace. Of course, the, the poet would say also connecting the building with the sky, but that is maybe to put it too generously. Uh, Heritage Center uh, in uh, that place, which I cannot read, 2007. I don't know. This reminds me a little bit of a building by um, uh, Christian de Portson Park in Luxembourg. Uh, again, just like in the case of Kevin Roach, I think he, beca he became a little bit too seduced by the bigness of his projects, maybe he also uh, began to, you know, approach older age. But in older age, Le Corbusier built a cabanon, that sublime uh, anti-masterpiece, which in my opinion is superior to Villa Savoie, uh, 16 square meters room. But these architects who do not have the, the non-conformism of Le Corbusier, they, 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 they began to be more and more uh, animated by uh, power and success and bigness. The bigger, the better. You could very well say, well, these are the programs that he was commissioned with, 
okay, accept them, but also try to not neglect the small, the, 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 that little architecture that you practice or almost little by comparison at the beginning. Unfortunately, we don't see this. So both in the case of Kevin Roach and the case of Arthur Erickson, I would say their best works were done in their earlier years. This is rather predictable architecture. Columns, columns again. I, I sympathize with Wolf Briggs who said, never columns, you know. Indeed, when I see these columns, I, 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 I shudder. I, I, have, uh, I, have, uh, um, I have an antipathy. I love, the col I love the columns of the Temple of Hera in Pestum, those predori columns, those, yes, but these are conveniences, architectural conveniences that are very predictable and boring, actually. The Museum of Glass. This, this though, is an interesting work from 2009. And of glass it is, indeed. I mean, there are these pieces of glass here, which I don't think they have any function except to show that they are glass. And being the Museum of Glass, I guess appropriately so. And there are also curious things. I don't think he made this, maybe a sculptor, but, uh, you know, interesting additions, not to speak about, of course, the, the beauty of, of nature, which wherever the case is, it asserts herself with uh, that spontaneity, which I use, I, I wish the human beings have to, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, yes, it, it is the architect of, uh, it is the work of an architect, it is the museum of glass, and as I said, glass it is. I don't know exactly what they do here, uh, but uh, I like them exactly because I don't know what their function is, you know. Eh, they, they, they are kind of mysterious and um, I don't know. I don't know what why they are there. I like the fact. I accept the fact that they. I don't know why they are there. And yeah, otherwise, the building. What can I say? We have seen such buildings. Even something like this, which is very similar in a way. Now that now that I think of it, of the cupola, the dome of uh, the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright. But also the function of this museum is interesting. The Museum of Glass, why not? The Canada House in Vancouver, 2009, we're approaching the end of the presentation. The Ericsson Vancouver, uh, I guess I, I couldn't find pictures with his latest works, but I found a picture of this uh, Trump International Hotel and tower in Vancouver, which I don't know if it was built or it was in the process of getting built. Um, here it is, twisted as many things these days are, twisted, twisted architecture. And I am ending the presentation about Arthur Erickson with a question, why do we need to twist things? Why can't we just build them like this? or like this, or like this, or like this. I'm not saying that I don't like the twisting. I am just asking, why, uh, why the need for twisting? What do you think? Trump, as immodest as the man himself, the five letters. And the tower twisted, as he was, uh, notorious for twisting truth. Thank you. And happy birthday, uh, Arthur Erickson, and happy birthday, Kevin Roach.